Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this web conference titled Practical Steps to Improve Safety Culture. My name is Megan Shetterly, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Dr. Greg S. Meyer, MD, is the Chief Clinical Officer of the Partners Healthcare System in Boston, Massachusetts. He is responsible for overall direction, operations, and management of system aspects of healthcare delivery throughout the Partners Healthcare Delivery System. Dr. Meyer previously served as the Chief Clinical Officer and Executive Vice President for Population Health at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and held leadership positions at Massachusetts General Hospital and Massachusetts General Physicians Organization, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and Uniform Services University of Health Sciences where he served as the Colonel in the United States Air Force. He is Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude graduate of Union College and Magna Cum Laude graduate of Albany Medical College. He earned a master's degree at Oxford University where he was a Rhodes Scholar. In addition, he holds a master's degree from the Department of Health Policy and Management from the Harvard School of Public Health and served as a fellow in the U.S. Senate Labor and Human Resources Committee's Health Office. So, Dr. Meyer, now I'll turn the program over to you. Good morning, and thanks to all of you for, uh, for joining us, and I especially want to thank the, uh, the Patient Safety Authority for allowing me to speak to you during Patient Safety Awareness Week. So, happy Patient Safety Awareness Week to all of you. What I'm going to do this morning is, uh, is spend the next 45 to 50 minutes or so talk to you about practical steps to improve safety culture, things that you can, things that you can do. This isn't about making big, huge investments and having to go to the CFO. Uh, this is about things that you can really kind of pick up, and many of them you can literally do tomorrow. I think the most important thing, though, that I need to say on the title slide that you see in front of you is, is point out that asterisk there, because it's really important to recognize that nobody has the, all the answers here, and we are all learning um, as we go along, and I'm from the, you know, uh, share openly, steal shamelessly school, and so, so I'm going to share with you some of the lessons I have. I don't want anyone to, to leave this talk and say, oh, my God, they've got it all figured out. If only we were like them, because like the rest of you, we are, uh, we're still learning and, and at times stumbling along. But with that said, I think that there are some practical lessons that I'm happy to uh, happy to share with you this morning. Um, just by way of disclosures, to let you know, I'm a member of the, uh, the, the, the boards of the Partners Community Physician Organization. I'm also a board member at the Joint, Commis Joint Commission and the Crico Risk Management Foundation, Virginia Mason Medical Center, and also on the board of directors of the National Patient Safety Foundation. Um, and I work as a consultant um, and an expert in quality. Let me begin just by, by, I think, giving some context, and I think all of you recognize that when you, we speak to our clinical colleagues on the front line about, about trying to get more engaged in working on safety, uh, that they are, it's one of many, many things that they're facing. And I guess to try to give you a sense of at least the way that, that I experience, my colleagues uh, here in Boston experience the current healthcare environment, I take you all the way back to your high school biology class. And, and, and if you look at the kind of pictures here, what we learned in high school biology about evolution was that the way that a new species comes about is there are, you know, very small mutations that over generations and generations lead to a new species forming. That's a very, very gradual change. And that, that is best illustrated by the butterflies on the left here, and that's called gradualism. But in the 1950s, uh, Stephen Jay Gould looked at the fossil record, and what he saw is that every now and then you get a phenomenon more like the butterflies on the right, where you get a very dramatic change over a very short period of time. And, and what he discovered was that that was not because the butterfly somehow became more genetically unstable, but it's because the environment conspired in such a way that it required relatively rapid change over a short period of time. And the term that evolutionary biologists give to this is punctuated equilibrium. And I would argue to you that what all of us are experiencing in healthcare right now 
is punctuated equilibrium. We are going through a period with very rapid disruptive changes. When we talk to some of our colleagues, you know, who were practicing in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, what they'll say is they'll say, you know, there were things that came and went, but, you know, we could just wait it out. Things passed, and, and, and there were only really small changes over time. That's not what we're living through. And so as we think about what we're asking our colleagues to engage in, I think we need to keep it in the context of that rapid pace of change around all of us. What I'd like to do this morning is just talk to you a little bit about the, the, the need for creating a safe culture, the why. You know, why is this worth it? And then talk about some of the key elements as a foundation to create a safe culture in healthcare. Um, and then hopefully give you some ideas about, you know, what kind of metrics you'd use to understand whether or not you're, uh, whether or not you're making progress. I mean, what are we measuring? Why is it important? How, what are we doing about it? And, and how are we doing? Let me just start by, you know, sharing with you what is, you know, the, a widely accepted definition of culture. It's what a group learns in order to cope with its external environment and internal relationships. And that's kind of the sociologic definition, but really the, the more practical definition is just the way we do things around here. And the notion is that, you know, one attitude is an opinion, but everyone's attitude actually forms what we call a culture. Uh, and safety climate is, you know, the perceptions of a strong and proactive commitment to patient safety in this unit, in this hospital, in this healthcare organization. And so when we think about culture, I think that the simplest way to think about it is just that this is the way we do things around here. One of the things that's important to remember, though, is, is culture is, it has a context to it. Um, and, you know, this is a slide that was shared with me by a, by a friend and colleague, Ed Schein, from, uh, from the Sloan School at MIT, who is a, uh, a leader in the field of organizational behavior. Um, and it's an old cartoon, but it makes an important point, and that is, is that when we start to talk about culture and experience, it's important to understand the context of where someone's coming from, because, you know, in the world in which this particular child lives, um, you know, corners don't really exist. You know, I think it's important to, to, first of all, take a step back and try to, try to really get well grounded in the notion of why is this important? Why is it worth it to be working on culture? And I, I have several cases I would make for it. And the first is, is the work of Peter Protovost and, and Brian Sexton and his colleagues when they were all at Johns Hopkins. Um, and what you can see here is located on, on this graph are a number of units. So each of those bars represents a unit. What you can see here uh, is the, the nurse staff and teamwork climate and the physician uh, staff and teamwork climate. What's important to, to know is, is that, yes, we can measure this, and this is looking at a, a, a patient safety climate survey, um, but not only can you measure it, but it's important. It's important, important to things that matter. You know, and, and clearly one of the things that matters is looking at nurse turnover, and you find that those units without a great safety climate, the turnover is awful high, and when you look at those who are doing extraordinarily well, the turnover is, is less than half. And what all of us know is that there are extraordinary costs associated with excessive turnover. Those costs include discontinuity in patient management. We know that it's hard to maintain our high level of performance with lots of turnover. And there's also extraordinary costs in terms of recruitment and training of new personnel. And so there's a real case to make here. Boy, if we could actually improve that climate, um, we'd reduce turnover and there'd be some payoffs both on the patient care side, on the, pay, the experience of work for uh, those on the front lines, and frankly, financially to the bottom line as well. In, in terms of thinking about how it plays out for, for you know, hard patient outcomes, um, again, going back to the work of Pronovos and his colleagues, here looking at their experience in Michigan um, with the Keystone Initiative, what you can see is that those who had the very best climate had the lowest rate of bloodstream infections. In fact, you know, those who achieved no bloodstream infections at all um, were much more likely to be among that group that really had a, a high-performing climate. You know, one of the other things I think that all of us face is that it's all well and good to, to kind of say, boy, we're going to maybe decrease turnover, and by the way, you know, there's a, an opportunity for us to improve some of our, our publicly reported metrics. But when you go and meet with the CFO, they're going to ask you the question is, what's the return on investment? You know, how is it, well, how much is this going to cost me and what am I going to get for it? And I'm going to give you four quick examples, and these aren't elegant economist, you know, analyses. 
these are just pretty practical things that, that I've found are useful. And I would say, you know, direct impact on operational performance, decreasing liability exposure, and, and insurance premiums, and improving your bond rating, which, by the way, is something that, you know, we talked to your CFO about that. They, they really care. Now, this is, these are beyond kind of that, that other important thing that we always talk about, you know, particularly with our boards of trustees, is, is what's really valuable is not being above the fold of the news, local newspaper with a poor quality story. That's priceless. Um, but with that said, assuming that that's true, you know, what are some other examples of trying to make that case? Uh, and, and here's a quick one, and this just shows you the hand hygiene experience at, at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And it goes from the period of, of around 2001 to, to the end of 2006. And what you can see uh, on those two upper uh, run charts is just the before and after contact hand hygiene with a lot of work in terms of trying to improve compliance with that over time. And you can see the rate uh, of methicillin resistant staph aureus infections in the hospital. And you know, when we talk to our infectious disease colleagues, they are pretty convinced that this is true, true, and related. Um, that is the one improved, the other one, the other one decreased. Now, if you actually take a step back and say, well, how much does this cost me? We spent some money on our hand disinfectant. The product that was used was something called CalStat. We also pay for a surveillance system, so we have the data, um, so we can have the transparency to know how we're doing. Um, we actually had a one-time incentive across the entire organization. Mass General has a, about 1,000 beds and about 21,000 employees, and so we had a relatively modest one-time incentive to say, let's all try to get to a certain mark with hand hygiene. Um, one of the things that people say is, well, when you stop paying for it, does it stick? Um, and our experience has been, yeah, it does. It does stick because of two reasons. Number one is that you have that opportunity to really make the case of why this is so important. But number two is that at some level, many of us who have been involved with aggressive hand hygiene uh, campaigns can't walk by an alcohol disinfecting container without you know, going over to it and using it. It becomes this brainstem phenomenon, frankly, and so you hardwire it into people's behaviors. And you can see that we had some modest spending on, on promotional material. So, so, you know, not a massive investment, but there was an investment here. Did it pay off? Well, actually, if you look at the literature, at the, the cost of how much we lost each time a patient had a MRSA infection in the hospital, around $31,000, and the number of cases that we prevented um, that we could measure uh, by our improved hand hygiene, this had a pretty good ROI. So we saved about seven and a quarter million dollars in, in just one year. Bloodstream infections, similar story, and this shows, you know, in terms of how we did over time with our, our rate per 1,000 line days, and, you know, we clearly hadn't gotten to zero at this point in time, and I know many of you are there right now. But when you actually take a step back and look at what it is that you had to invest in, um, actually, the program costs are pretty modest. Most of this is a, a cultural change, a change in workflow um, for our frontline providers. So relatively modest costs and actually relatively robust payback. Again, you know, each of those infections has an incremental cost of $45,000 per year. That whole notion of, well, you know, if someone gets an infection, we get paid more for it. Yeah, we do, at least we used to, um, before there were uh, healthcare-acquired uh, condition penalties. But the truth of the matter is, is that increased payment never covered the increased costs of those patients. Um, and so there is a financial benefit to it. And again, you can see here that we could generate, you know, the sense that we were saving about $1.6 million. To pull back the lens a little bit further, um, as we really started to focus on culture, you know, what we saw is we saw a measurable decline um, in our malpractice experience. Now, whether or not that was due to this alone, I would say no, there were lots of things going on, but they clearly were contemporaneous. And, you know, I would just say when you can take the credit, um, this just shows how Mass General did um, compared to others in the Harvard hospitals. And so the Harvard hospitals are, are, are extraordinary performers in terms of malpractice experiences, but Mass General did even better still. And then finally, um, one of the things, again, that our CFOs care a whole lot about is they care a lot about bond ratings. And, and this was a study that was done by the bond rating agencies. And what they looked at is they looked at, at, at composite scores on various publicly reported uh, quality metrics, um, things like heart failure, pneumonia, acute myocardial infarction. Um, and what they found is they found 
that as your quality, uh, quality improved, in fact, your bond rating was better. And as your quality kind of slipped, your bond rating slipped too. And so there's just some strong arguments that you can make that this is, is clearly worth doing. And so now that I hope you, you know, you're on board and you say, yeah, this is worth it, and I've got some ideas about how I can, how I can have that argument with my colleagues about why we need to, to make these investments, the question is, is, is how do we move forward? What are the things that we can actually do? And, you know, I don't have a, a long list here, um, but here's what I have. The first is, is to be just. Second is to be respectful. Third is to set our expectations explicitly. The fourth is to create some accountability. The fifth is to be transparent. The sixth is be demanding. The seventh is be patient, be patient enough. And the eighth is take care of yourself. Um, and, and this comes just from my own practical experience and you know, one of the things I had an opportunity to do, there's a, a small book on the bottom there. Uh, it's a book by Paul Batolden, who is really, I think, one of the, the leaders in the healthcare quality movement um, in, in the United States. And, and Paul got together a group of folks who were working hard on trying to improve quality and safety in healthcare and asked them to share their lessons learned and how they learned them. And in many ways, this is an extraction of both my contribution to that, but also um, the work that uh, Paul pulled together from other folks who who've been toiling in these fields. And what I want to leave you with at the end is a to-do list. So let's kind of dig in. You know, but before we do so, a couple of fallacies. Um, and one of the fallacies is, is this notion that, you know, if only I had more authority, if only I had a larger job title, I could do this. I could actually change culture. And there's this notion out there that span of control is important. And what I would tell you is working on change in either a micro system, in a, in, a, in a small clinic, or on a big healthcare system, or at the state level, or in federal health policy, and, and everything in between those has the same challenges. And so don't wait for the big job or the big title to get started. Frankly, there's a lot of, a lot of progress you can make right now. The second is that, you know, what we need is we just need the right data. If only I had the right data, I would be able to con just convince everybody this is the right thing to do and everyone would fall in line and magic would happen. Um, and, and the truth of the matter is, is that really it's a lot about data, but it's also about having good stories along with it. Um, to be able to, to set priorities, which is really the tough part. And I think one of the things we have to remind ourselves is that no important decision is made with sufficient information. If you are waiting to try to get the perfect information in order to drive your decision making, your cultural change, you're never gonna get anything done. You have to get comfortable working with messy data. We're always gonna to have to deal with the uncertainty. The third fallacy is the notion that individuals drive improvement. If only I was more charismatic, if only I could get my colleagues more engaged, if only you know, I, I was just a bit more effective, I'd be able to get this job done. And the truth of the matter is, is that working on cultural change requires a lot of help. And there's a, a, another book I'd contend, uh, I would commend to you. This is, again, from my friend Ed Shine, who, who used to be at the Sloan School at MIT. And he wrote a book about helping. And basically what he said is that the higher up we, we go in an organization, um, that the more unlikely it is is that we ask for help. And one of the things that, that he taught me is the very first thing I do every morning when I get to work is I think, what am I trying to accomplish today? Who do I need help from? Um, and I send out or make the, send out the emails or make the phone calls um, or send the text messages to my colleagues and say, hey, I need help on this today. Um, and so it's being humble, the humble inquiry of asking for help. Um, and then finally, you know, the notion that, boy, you know, I could do this, but I need to get more training. I need to get that MBA or that MPH or, or that health administration degree. And the truth of the matter is, is that being a cultural change agent is going to help you get the next job. You know, somebody who can actually get into an organization and improve it um, is going to have a leg up on somebody with a, a lot of letters after their name. And so, so don't get trapped into that notion of, boy, I, I've got to go and get more training before I can, can tackle this stuff. It's also important to kind of put it in the context of what I call the iron laws of cultural improvement. And I think the first one is B teams with A systems always beat A teams with B systems. What do I mean by that? I mean that we need to focus a lot on the systems rather than focusing on making sure that we got the very best people. You know, and there's that soccer coach dilemma. And the soccer coach dilemma is, you know, do I want the 11 best players or the best 11 players? Do I want 11 superstars or do I want 11 people who can really work well together and, and move things forward? And the answer is, is the latter. 
You know, the second point is that it's not the seed, it's the soil. We often get so hung up in the notion of choosing, you know, this method versus that method um, for an intervention or working with this vendor over that vendor to try to help us move something forward. Um, and we spend so much time talking about the seed, but really what's so necessary is preparing the soil, is getting people ready for the change. It ends up that, that one of the worst things that we can ever do is have a really great intervention that ought to work, but not prepare our colleagues sufficiently for it so that it fails. And the reason why that's so terrible is because they're not going to go back to it again. And so take the time to prepare the soil. You know, recognize the political is always much more challenging than the technical. And finally, you know, my own practical experience of testifying before Congress and meeting with boards and, and others who I'm trying to persuade to a point of view, it's great to have great data and, and nice statistics, but at the end of the day, what really captures attention is when you have the data, but you can put a face on it. And I always, you know, hearken back to uh, Carl White, who was, a, who was kind of one of the giants of American epidemiology, and he would frequently use the quote that, that statistics are patients with the tears wiped off. And one of the things that we need to do is we need to wipe those tears off and show those faces to our colleagues, to tell the stories. So it's, it's you know, here's, here's how well we're doing with hand hygiene, but oh my goodness, here's the story of the patient who got MRSA in my organization, and here's what it meant to them and what it meant to their, their, their families, and here's what it did, you know, here's how the caregivers perceived it. Those are very, very powerful. So pull both those, those elements together. Let me dive in with the, you know, kind of the first kind of practical point, and that is, is to be just. And, and by way of an example, um, in, uh, in January of 2010, a patient was admitted to, to my hospital, the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, um, and uh, had a relatively straightforward uh, surgery that was going to be done. And, but during the surgery had some minor arrhythmias, so it just had some, some changes in their heart rate, and it was felt prudent that post-surgically to put that patient on a cardiac monitor. And the patient was sent to the floor, and the patients did remarkably well um, in the immediate post-op period and was on a, on a regular floor. Um, the patient was seen walking um, in the hallways, uh, it, which, was, uh, which was terrific, and, um, and the nurses uh, noted that uh, he looked really great. Um, and he was being monitored, had a cardiac monitor on at the time. A short while later, a nurse walked by the patient's room um, and the patient was dead in bed with the alarm turned off. It's horrible, it's horrible. What happened? Some hypotheses. First hypothesis was, you know, that, that, that the, the nurse was, uh, was, was busy and, uh, and, you know, that patient's alarm had been having, the monitor had been having some problems, you know, and been going off and, and clearly this patient was up and walking around. Uh, and the patient walked into, walk, the nurse walked into the patient's room um, and she confronted the monitor and the monitor had a, a you know, set of buttons on it and, and she reached out and she hit the pause button. And it looked much like the pause buttons on our, our IV pumps and other, you know, other instrumentation that we use. So she hit the pause button. But the problem was it wasn't a pause button. The problem was that this monitor didn't have a pause button. It only had an on-off switch. She turned the monitor off. That's a hypothesis. Second hypothesis would be that, you know, that what was going on was that, it was that, you know, that patient was up and about and they were looking good and the monitor was giving them trouble because it kept on going off and it was all artifact and, and so, you know, the nurse thought, you know, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to turn that monitor off um, because the patient doesn't need it anymore and I'll just, you know, when the, when the surgical house staff are available later in the day, I'll have them come and write the order to, to take off the monitor. Third hypothesis would be, you know, the nurse was having a really rough day, and uh, boy, uh, it's, of all, you know, here's this guy walking around, didn't even need to be on a monitor. Why did they put this guy on a monitor to start with? He's looking great, and, and the monitor's going crazy. These things just don't work that well, and, and, and it's firing off all the time, and I'm running back and forth. I've got four other patients to take care of, and you know something? Just forget, I'm going to turn this thing off. I'm going to ignore it. I don't know which of those hypotheses are correct. 
To this day, I don't know. But what I do know is that the way you try to think about these events really matters. One of the things to recognize is systems are never 100% reliable or foolproof. You know, that monitor had a design flaw, and the design flaw is that it looked a lot like a lot of the other instrumentation and equipment that we use, most of which when you hit a button to silence it, it goes off for a minute or two and comes back on again. And if there's a, a reason for it to alarm, it will alarm again. Um, this one just had an on-off switch, and so we worked with the manufacturer and, and, and they worked on that. And it's important to recognize, though, that, that there are no systems, there are no instruments that, that are 100% foolproof. And I always remind myself, you know, the space shuttle was designed to have failures of less than one in a hundred times. Now, they could have made it to have failures of less than one in a thousand times and added a couple of zeros to the cost of building a space shuttle. There are always trade-offs. And it's important to recognize that health systems uh, are far less reliable. And if you want to dig in uh, you know, to this concept a little bit more, I'd uh, commend to you a book by uh, Richard Bomer um, called Designing Care, which is, uh, which is on the slide here. One of the things that we often think about is, is well, you know, let's, um, it, you, the way for us to handle things is, is we ought to make sure that we just have really, really strong policies. If only we had great policies um, that, and people followed them, this kind of stuff wouldn't happen. There ought to be a policy about, you know, the steps that you have to take to turn a patient's monitor off and, and how you got to get permission and all the rest. We ought to have a policy for that. And I take myself back all the way to when I was in officer's training school in the Air Force, and I had the privilege of, of hearing from Bo Bobek, who was one of the original, original NASA astronauts. And Bo Bobek shared with us Bo's law. And, and Bo's law said that uh, the fastest way to get yourself killed on a manned space flight is to not follow standard operating procedure. Okay, that sounds pretty reasonable. But Bo went on and said the second quickest way to get yourself killed is to always follow standard operating procedure, right? And so let me talk a little bit about that. And uh, let me give you a, a, an example. And this is kind of when, you know, standard operating procedure is no damn good. Um, and, and we had a visit from the Joint Commission um, at the MGH uh, about, uh, about nine years or so ago. And, and they found, among other things, they found that we had violated our transfusion policy. Um, and in fact, they said, based on our transfusion policy, we had given unsafe transfusions 42 times. 42 times. Wow. What our policy says, our policy said that before a unit could be, this was before we had uh, barcoding, and, and it said before a unit could be administered, you had to have two licensed professionals, uh, licensed independent professionals, usually RNs in this case, who would independently review the, the, the information on the unit of blood, compare that and match that with the patient, and they had to sign off with their full name and their credentials. So, you know, Mary Smith, RN, and, you know, and Jane Jones, RN. And what the Joint Commission found is 42 times we violated that policy. Um, and boy, that, that got our attention because as you know, blood transfusions are, are, you know, are a high risk intervention. And so we, uh, we dug into it and boy, there they were. Um, we found that instead of signing the full names, there was instead of, you know, Jane Jones, you know, and Mary Smith, it was just JJ and MS on 42 units of blood. We violated our policy over and over again. Who's the same patient? Oh, by the way, those 42 unit, units of blood were administered is less than an hour. 42 units of blood in less than an hour. And by the way, the patient walked out the door. Right, that patient survived. The patient had a catastrophic hemorrhage um, and uh, required massive, massive transfusion. And while that was going on, the nurses didn't have time to sign their full name and put their credentials there. Did I violate our standard operating procedure? You bet. Was it the right thing for the patient? You bet. So, they're not, just having policies isn't quite enough. 
I'm an ice hockey player, and uh, here's a good reminder to me, you know, of, of you know how policies work sometimes, or in this case, don't work so great when the "do not shoot pucks off the wall" sign uh, becomes the target for uh, for uh, practicing your your shot. Um, I think it's a, a good reminder that that policies don't always work so great. So if we can't just solve the policies, you know, what do we do? And I would say. You know, we should learn from the work of David Marks and his colleagues um, about just culture. And, and my colleague, Lucien Leap, says the single greatest impediment to error prevention is that we punish people for, for making mistakes. Um, and it's important to remember that there are some things that we can always expect. To err is human. We all make mistakes. We all have slips and lapses. They occur. We also, at times, engage in at-risk behavior where we make a choice. We say, I'm going to push the edge of the envelope here a little bit because I think I'm good at it. I think I can get away with it. Or, boy, I think I need to do that. And then rarely, and I would be underline again, rarely, we count what, what I would call reckless behavior, behavioral choice with you know, disregard to a substantial and an unjustifiable risk. When we do something, we know we're doing something wrong, and we just don't care. Um, and that's the good news about that. That's exceedingly wrong. Um, and it's important to recognize that there are some really dangerous interactions here. And one of them is between human error and drift. You know, to err is human and to drift is human. And what we all need to recognize is that, that when we drift, we actually set ourselves up for having greater consequences from the fact that we all have slips and lapses. You know, having a slip and lapse uh, when you're, uh, you know, when you're, when you're trying to, to think about, you know, getting something done, um, you know, when you're sitting at your desk in the office is one thing, but having a slip or lapse when you're behind the wheel of your car driving through a residential neighborhood, that's completely different. You know, and I, I can't do an audience poll here, but, uh, you know, if I asked any of you, you know, do you ever text and drive, um, I'm sure if we you know, had a large enough audience and you were all honest, that, that someone would, would come forward and say, yeah, yeah, I do. You know, well, why do you do that? You do it because you think you can. You do it because, hey, I've figured out a way to do it. I only do it on the straightaways. I only do it when I'm you know, going less than 30 miles an hour. You know, I only do it when you know, I'm at a traffic light. Um, and the reality is, is that we lull ourselves as we think we're gaining more expertise, we lull ourselves into thinking that, you know, I can get away with this. And what happens is we get, we actually put ourselves at more and more risk. So, you know, you can get away with, with that texting and driving, as you can see in the photos here, um, until that one day when the kid's chasing a ball in front of you. And, and, you know, we have many, many examples of that in healthcare. So what do we do? How do we handle this? You know, and, you know, the, the, again, you know, borrowing on the work of David Marks, um, we need to recognize that everyone makes a mistake. That poor driver, you know, in the photograph on the left, they didn't wake up that morning and say, I want to tear the you know, hose off a, a gas pump. That wasn't what they woke up to do. Um, and, and by and large, our colleagues in healthcare don't wake up in the morning and say, I want to give a patient the wrong dose of medicine today, or I want to do the wrong test, you know, or I don't want to follow up on that lab result, um, that we all have slips and lapses. And when we do, the right thing to do is to console that individual. We are all human. I'm sorry that happened to you. It's hard to do, but so important. Sometimes we push the edge of the envelope. We start to drift. We develop that at-risk behavior. So the right thing to do there is to coach people. Say, hey, listen, you know something? That texting and driving thing, not such a great idea. And very, very rarely there is that red line very rarely you encounter a behavior where you'd say, you know something, this was reckless, they knew it was wrong, and they still went ahead and did it, and they put somebody in jeopardy. You know, giving a pop star propofol at home is reckless, and that needs to be punished. So we all make mistakes. When we do, we should console each other. When we start to drift, we need to coach, and in those rare events, where there's truly reckless behavior, you have to discipline. How do you get started? Talk to your staff about those three behaviors. 
You know, again, look at the just culture literature. It's very powerful. Here's a real simple way. You know, my chief nurse at Mass General, whenever something goes wrong, whenever a patient is, is harmed or nearly harmed in a close call, when, a, when, when that occurs, what she does is she asks the nurse involved to come and see her in her office. And when that nurse shows up, the chief nurse has one question. And the question is, were you trying to hurt that patient? The answer is universally no. And the chief nurse then hugs the nurse and says, I'm sorry we let this happen to you. I'm sorry we let this happen to you. Sorry we had systems that we allowed you to make that mistake. It's really powerful. That doesn't cost any money. That doesn't cost a, you know, a, a, a big budget request. It's just a change of behavior. It's simple. You can do it. Um, you know, and the next thing, don't ask that fourth W. What's the fourth W? Well, you know, when you walk in a hospital and you hear, boy, something went wrong last night. Questions we should be asking is what happened? Why did it happen? What can we do to prevent it from happening again? But there's always that fourth question is who did it? The big W. Don't ask it. Just don't ask it. It doesn't matter. And celebrate it. Celebrate that approach. Celebrate the fact that you know something. Yep, you know, we all make mistakes and, and share. we're going to share them with each other openly. The next thing is be respectful. You know, Gandhi had it right. You know, if we could change ourselves, the tendency in the world would also change. One of the last things that we, we can't control all the changes going on in healthcare. As I said in the beginning, there's this punctuated equilibrium. There's a lot going on. But what we can always do is we can always control the way that we treat each other. So be respectful. Here are some articles that I, I had the opportunity to, to write with Lucian Leap and some other colleagues, um, which basically say, you know, that we are what we tolerate. And we have to understand the nature and causes of disrespectful behavior and what we can do about it. And so a really simple thing, just look at the art, just read the abstracts of the articles, share them, have journal clubs with your staff on it, talk about it, just get the discussion going. Set expectations, right? Set expectations explicitly. Tell people what you expect. Here's some work that we did at Mass General, and, and it was the journey. It was coming up with the words that was really important. It's not the words in the end, but it's how we got people involved and engaged in having discussion. And we said, here's what we all expect each other, of each other at Mass General. And you read this, and boy, it's a lot of mom and apple pie, but boy, there's that third bullet you know, on the bottom that's highlighted. Share my successes and my errors with my colleagues so we can all learn from each other. But along with this kind of mom and apple pie credo, there's the other side. And it's, you know, what are the boundaries? What are the things that we as a community say are just not acceptable? And, you know, there are two of them here that are germane to this conversation. You know, the first one is recklessly ignoring the policies and procedures. So again, not saying we're going to ignore, you know, we're not going to punish people for ignoring a policy, because sometimes you have to. But if you do it recklessly, as we were talking about before in a justice culture, that's not acceptable. And criticize and take action against any member of the community for raising or reporting a safety concern. That is not tolerable. Right? That we want people to come forward, right? And we're going to celebrate the fact they came forward, and we're going to try to learn from it, but we're not going to tolerate retaliation. Um, and having sending a strong, strong message on that is very, very, very helpful to moving your culture forward. Create some accountability. Um, I don't want to pick on physicians here, but that's where the data is. This is work from my colleague Jerry Hickson at Vanderbilt. And what you can see here is that when you look at the number of concerns that are raised about physicians by, by patients and complaints and, and colleagues, that it's actually the vast majority of physicians have either none or almost none. Um, and it's a very small group of doctors um, that not, the less than 10% of doctors accounted for 50% of those recorded concerns or, or complaints. And by the way, what we know is we actually, if we look at them, that we can predict their risk. So those who have higher complaints actually are going to have more malpractice dollars paid out for them. And again, um, some references here that you can really make a pretty strong argument that we need to pay attention. We need to create some accountability. And, uh, this, again, is, is the work of Hickson and colleagues just saying what you need to have is you need to have a pyramid. 
You need to have a period where you say, you know something, if you see something going on um, that, that, you know, disrespectful behavior, you know, a, a, a non-collaborative um, discussion between colleagues, um, the first thing you need to do is you just need to, to point it out. Have that cup of coffee. Hey, let me tell you what I saw. Don't ask about why it happened. Just say, here's what I saw. I just want to let you know I saw it, and that's not what I expect of you. That's not the way we treat each other around here. I just want to let you know I saw it, and I, it bothered me a little bit, and, and I just want you to be aware. Sometimes you need to go beyond the awareness and, and escalate it up, and very rarely you're going to need to take this all the, all the way to discipline. But, but have some accountability there. Let people know that, that we're watching each other. We're each, we are holding each other accountable for the culture that we are creating, that we're stewards of. One of the things we can also do in creating accountability is, is spend time on what I call the brighter side of the performance curve. Um, and, and that is to say we spend so much time on the left side of the performance curve here, looking at, at low performance um, and saying, okay, how can we improve that? Or, or you know, what, what do we need to do to work on that? But it's important to remember that we can learn just as much from high performance. And we spend a lot of time doing root cause analyses on, on close calls or when things go really, really badly. But I would argue to you that you can learn just as much by looking at when things really go right, when something extraordinary happens. And earlier I was talking to some of the, the folks uh, from the, the state authority about, you know, the whole experience with the marathon bombing um, here in Boston. What a tr terrible, tragic event. Yet the way that the medical community responded was superb. Not one single person who didn't die on the scene died afterwards. 100% survival of everybody who was taken from the scene. That's extraordinary. Why did that happen? Because all of the Swiss cheese holes lined up in the right way. And we can learn as much from positive deviance when things go right as we can when things go wrong. One of the things that we've done is, is when we're showing, uh, is we're showing data, what we will do sometimes, is, as is illustrated in the bottom, this is a response to a, a safety culture survey, is what we do is we're transparent with the people who did really well, right? And so we celebrate the fact that, hey, look at these units. They actually did much better than the others. And by the way, when you start to share this broadly, people start to show up there and say, hey, what did you do? What's, what, what are you doing differently? You know, what's different about the way that your unit works compared to mine? So celebrate that positive deviance. Use the accountability, you know, creatively. So it's not just about, about bad apples and disrespectful behavior, but it's really about harvesting that positive deviance. Be transparent. This is a, a newspaper story from the New York Times dated 1852. And what it talks about is a patient who came to the Massachusetts General Hospital to have an amputation done, and that young person died shortly after the surgery, and the reason why they died, as you read through the story here, is they died because we had a wrong drug error. Because instead of giving that patient ether, we made a mistake, and the substance in the bottle was chloroform, and we poisoned them with chloroform. Now, here's what you should pay attention to, right? This was published in the newspaper. The headline is, Fatal Mistake at the Mass General Hospital, and the surgeon involved has their name right there in print. Wow, that's pretty extreme transparency. So nothing's new under the sun. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And we're stewards of trying to, to build further on that transparency. And, you know, and this is a, 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 a kind of interesting historical note that, uh, that, that, that there was an effort at Mass General in the early 20th century to try to share our end results in the community and Dr. Codman who many of you will know is one of the kind of the, 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 the real uh, leading lights of, of the healthcare quality movement in the United States, a man well ahead of his time. Um, he was basically run out of town on a rail for this. Um, but you'll know, think about where we are today, and in many ways, Dr. Codman's work led to the formation of the Joint Commission and the quality work of the American College of Surgeons. So, so a, a long, long time uh, for this to come forward, but, but transparency has kind of come to the forefront now. So how do you be transparent? And I would say, you know, simple reference for you, go to the National Patient Safety Foundation website. There's a free report there you can download. It has a very nice executive summary with a very clear checklist of recommendations saying, here are things that have been tried in transparency. Are they going to work for everybody? Maybe not. But here are things that, that some organizations have tried and they seem to work. 
Um, and, and here's some examples of, of trying to be transparent. One of the things I've always struggled with is how do you talk to a board of trustees and, and summarize all of the patient safety reports that you got in a year? You know, we'll get here in this case, getting about 20,000 reports in a single year in 2014 at Mass General. One of the things that we do uh, is we just create a Wordle. We go, go on this free online software and we take all the, the text from our safety reports and we run it, and very quickly you can look at this and say, wow, the big issues are communications and medications. So, so powerful. Doesn't cost a lot of money, but you get the message across to a lay audience very, very quickly. Um, and use transparency as a cultural lever. And one of the things that we discovered, you know, at Mass General is, is when things don't go so well, and here, you know, there's a story from the Boston Globe about a Joint Commission survey that didn't go the way we want, but the truth of the matter is, is, is we had some improvement that we needed to make. Um, but rather than let the newspapers tell the story, we posted all our Joint Commission results out there on the website. You can go to the Mass General website today. You can see the latest Joint Commission results, and they all have the same four questions. What are we measuring? Why is it important? How are we doing? And what are we doing about it? Right? That is you know, a very simple format. Don't let the newspapers tell your quality story. Get out there on your own. Share it transparently. You know, the University of Utah has gone a step further where they actually post all their physician comments from their COP surveys, the, the open-ended field, they publish that and, and share that with the public. Be demanding. Um, and, and this just shows you two curves. The curves, one of them shows the amount of board time that is spent on finance, um, and that's the uh, fuchsia line there. And the dark blue line is how much time is spent on quality and safety. So I'm a measurement guy, and so I said, you know something? I need more time talking about quality and safety than the CFO needs talking about finances when we meet with the board. That's not because finances aren't important. I get it, no margin, no mission, very important. And I would argue, you know, maybe even equally important to, to, to the quality and safety. But the truth of the matter is, is your trustees and your organizations come from our leading business people in your community. You can show them very complicated profit and loss statements and they understand it in a heartbeat. But you need time to explain to them what looking at hand hygiene means. How do they interpret you know, the number of patient safety reports you have. What does your readmission rate mean? You need time to explain that. And so, so you need more time in front of the board. Measure it. Make sure you should have more time in front of your board talking about quality and safety than the CFO does talking about finances. Be patient. Um, it pains me as an Air Force officer to show, you know, the Navy looking really good, but uh, here it goes. And this shows you that the, you know, the effort of the Navy to make um, naval aviation and carrier landing safe took place with many different interventions over a period of decades. So, you know, sometimes, you know, we just have to be a little bit patient, but only be patient enough. Choose your battles wisely. Decide, you know, when it is that we're going to have, a, a, you know, a lightning war, a blitzkrieg, when we're going to just do it. When does it make sense just to make the change? When does it make sense to kind of wait it out, to let time, you know, time save it? And I always remind my colleagues, that there are some interventions, boy, I'd love for us to make progress, but I'm not going to push on it because time and I against any other two. Just sometimes don't fight back, just let time move things along. Uh, and, and I always remind myself of you know, Martin Luther King's uh, statement, which I employ often, um, I may be delayed, but not defeated. Let your, co your colleagues know that, you know that you're going to be persistent about this, and, uh, and that can take you a very long way. Take care of yourself. Change hurts. Um, if you're trying to improve safety in your organization, you're going to be asking people to do things that aren't always going to be so popular. If your goal is to make everybody happy, you're not going to be very happy. You're in trouble. And I always remind myself, they taught me in the Air Force, you know, if you're taking flack, you're over a high-value target. If everything that you do, every intervention you have, people are sitting around the table and saying, kumbaya, this is the greatest thing, Truth of the matter is you're probably not accomplishing very much. But if you actually have people who have strong opinions and pushing back and, and you know, arguing out the details, hey, you're, you're on to something important um, and, and keep at it. Part of taking care of yourself is getting support. Um, and one of the things that I've found has been valuable to me as a healthcare professional trying to lead change and, and trying to work on safety and culture is to have a group of friends who, who are doing similar work. And, there's a group of us that, uh, that get together every year. Um, we've been doing so for, uh, for you know, much longer, about 15 years or so now. 
Um, and we get together for a weekend every year and we share our stories with each other. You know, it, it is essentially a support group. They work at, at other places all around the country. We, every now and then we write a paper uh, about some of our discussions, but the truth of the matter is, is more than anything, it's a support group. You need to, to talk to others because, again, this work is not easy. Um, and then finally, you know, some personal advice. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. And you're going to need, as you, you know, go down this journey and you try to do this work, you're going to need to be adaptable. A to-do list. So some things for you to think about. Be just. You know, so, so include those questions about systems and behavioral choices when you review an event. Try to sort out, was this human error, was this drift, or was this that rare event of truly reckless? Just use the CNO question. Were you trying to hurt that patient? And if they weren't, give them, give them a hug. Be respectful. Review the articles in journal clubs. Set your expectations. Create your own credo. Create your own boundaries. Have the discussion. What is it that we all can agree we're not going to tolerate from each other? Create some accountability. So celebrate a positive deviant. Be transparent. Tell your story and publish your safety report wordle. You know, put all those safety reports together and, uh, and put together that one visual that captures it all. Be demanding. Ask your board to spend more time on quality and safety than they do on finance. And start every meeting with it. Have it be the first thing that comes out of CEO. And by the way, that presentation on quality and safety, it shouldn't be done by the chief quality or officer or the chief nurse or the chief net medical officer. It should be done by the CEO because the board needs to see that the CEO owns it. Be patient. You know, explicitly decide what your interventions are lightning wars, what you need to do right away and when you need to kind of wait it out, and then finally, take care of yourself. And the last thing I'll leave with you is, is to recognize that one of the most important things you can do is, uh, is keep a positive attitude. Um, while I was in the military, I had the, uh, I had the privilege of serving under uh, Colin Powell, who was the chief of staff at the time, and he got a group of us together, and he shared his wisdom. And the one point he made, which I thought was so important, is that optimism is a force multiplier. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you for spending part of your Patient Safety Awareness Week with me. I hope you find some of this helpful. I'm going to go back a couple, of, one slide here and just, just kind of focus on the to-do list. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Dr. Meyer. That, that was fabulous, very informative. Um, it contains valuable information everybody can use in their organization. This does conclude the slide presentation portion of the program. And as Dr. Meyer said, we would like to open it up for a question and answer period. So maybe while we're waiting for a couple of questions to arise, again, I'm gonna go back to this to-do list a, a bit. And I think I, one of the things I really want you to take away from this um, is when you think about you know, each, of these, uh, each of these recommendations, and again, you know, they, they, they may not work for everybody, but they've worked for, uh, they certainly worked for me, and I know they've worked for some others. Um, that, that this doesn't involve a big budget ask. There's no big, huge intervention here. There is, you know, no need to uh, set up a project management office for this. These are things that, that you can do or that you can work with your colleagues to do. And so, you know, that whole notion of just, you know, working with the, your chief nurse and saying, let's, let's make sure, and your chief medical officer, let's make sure that when, you know, that when something goes wrong that we reach out to that, that frontline caregiver directly, that we deal with them directly, that we console them, that we make sure that their needs are being met. You know, reviewing articles in Journal Club, um, you know, that doesn't, cost, that doesn't cost a lot of money, and I will guarantee you um, that if you give the, uh, if you give the uh, articles on, uh, on being respectful that are cited in the talk here, you distribute them to a, you know, a group of, of young physicians, young nurses, uh, house staff, um, and uh, and you know, open up your discussion and say, you know, hope you read those papers. And does any of that ring true um, for my, for this organization? And just sit back in your chair and buckle your seatbelt, um, and you will learn. Uh, you'll learn a lot. You'll get a lot of insights into what's into what's really going on. Um, you know, another one I you know that I I think has been so so important is that notion of of getting more time with the board. Um, you know, taking the time to educate the board, and again, this may lead to a little bit of friction between you and your CFO, um, but the reality is, is again, that, that you need more time to explain, you know, what, what the, the data that you're showing is or what the story that you're telling is, and, and always with your board, you know, use that combination of, yep, it's great for us to, to show you, you know, how well we're, we've done or, or what our struggles are with preventing readmissions, 
Um, but let's, before you, you know, after you look at some statistics, take one moment and tell the story about a patient. You know, and one of the, the examples here, I have the privilege of sitting on the board of Virginia Mason Medical Center um, in, uh, in, in Seattle, and one of the things that, that happens on that board is we start every board meeting talking about quality and safety, and they all begin with a patient story, and more often than not, the patient is in the room telling the story. That's brave. That's brave, but boy, it really catches, it catches the attention of the board, um, and it really improves our focus on quality and safety. And so again, these are, um, these are relatively simple. They shouldn't cost you a whole lot of money, um, and I would hope that you'll find that with time, they will start to have at least some effect on the culture of your organization. Uh, Dr. Meyer, I do have a question that just came in. Um, it says, I'm a director of patient safety and physician, and I have my first opportunity before physicians to talk about just culture. If this goes well, I'd like to do the same for other physician groups in my organization. Advice on how to get invited, who to ask? Yeah, I think the way to, to get invited is I think that you need to um, to really try to put it, uh, that question um, into a uh, into a real life scenario in your organization. So I talked to you about you know the, the story about the uh, about the monitor case that we had at Mass General. That was that case which was known throughout the organization. Everyone was embarrassed and felt so terrible for what had happened to that that patient. Don't waste a crisis. Don't waste the crisis. And so there's going to be something that didn't so, go so great or wasn't handled so well by your organization. Um, and so teach just culture and use that as an example because what I found is that by making it real that people actually, they showed up and they talked to their colleagues and said, hey, you know something? It's worth you listening to this because it seems like things are changing. We were, we're developing a different attitude. We're starting to do something different. So I, I think try to come up with a really strong example. You know, don't waste that crisis in your own organization. Um, use it as a way to say, we're thinking differently about this, and we need your help. We need your help to help us do it. So I, I, that's a great way um, to, get, to get started. And, and there's so much wonderful stuff, you know, out there from David Marks and others uh, on just culture. And, you know, leverage that and, uh, and get out there, tell us, and most importantly, people will watch. And so as you're, you know, you're giving your leadership role in patient safety, people are going to watch what you do. And the first time they see somebody getting punished, they're going to say, you know, something that just culture stuff, nah, they didn't mean it. It wasn't important. <laughs> but they forgot it so quickly. You've got, you, you know, you got to walk the walk. And so don't waste a crisis. Use an example from your own organization to illustrate the points in just culture. And secondly, walk the walk. Uh, we really appreciate you speaking for us today. It was a fabulous program, and I think it's something that everybody can take back to their organization and use. So this does conclude our webinar. Thank you, everyone.